We're ready to get started. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in for our fourth Thursday's Lunch and Learn webinar today. Uh, the topic is breast cancer prevention and the presenter is Dr. Julie Angia who is an assistant professor at, at in this section of hematology oncology at Lester and Sue Smith Breast Center at Baylor College of Medicine as well as the director of the high risk and prevention clinic at Bentop Hospital here in Houston. And in addition to all of that, she's also the head of our program committee who actually puts these webinars together. So thank you, Julie. And um, I will let her go ahead and get started with her presentation. Okay, everyone. Um, so I want to welcome, welcome you today. And this talk is going to be divided into three parts. Um, the first part of the talk is going to go over risk factors for breast cancer. The second part of the talk is going to be on prevention. And at the end, there will be a brief section on alternative medicines. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, so please write your questions down. So um, let's talk about the epidemiology of breast cancer and why prevention is so important. It's the most common type of cancer among women in the U.S., and in 2012, it's estimated that there'll be almost 227,000 cases of breast cancer and um, about 40,000 deaths from breast cancer. Risk factors for breast cancer include age. Breast cancer, although the publicity, you would think it's a disease of younger women, it's actually a disease of older women and much more common in older women. When people get to the age of over 80, it may be even be as common as one in six women. Um, race is a risk factor. Caucasians actually get breast cancer more common than other races, but African Americans pass away from breast cancer more often. Initially, this was thought to be because of socioeconomics and access to care, but in the past decade, we've realized that there's actually a difference in biology in cancers that different races get, and that African Americans are more prone to a more aggressive type of breast cancer, the triple negative type. Um, prior radiation therapy to the chest, such as someone who had Hodgkin's lymphoma many years ago, can be a risk factor for breast cancer. Increased breast density can be a risk factor. And um, this is beginning to be realized to be more and more important. We'll talk about a medicine called tamoxifen that we use in prevention. But after being on tamoxifen for five years, you can actually detect a decrease in breast density. So some of the mechanism of how it works does affect breast density. So this is um, becoming a more and more realized risk factor for breast cancer. Um, other risk factors include personal health history. So someone who has a personal history of breast cancer is at a much higher risk for a second breast cancer. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, the analogy I like to use is um, lung cancer and smoking because it's easier to understand because there's a known risk factor. But when a, a smoker inhales um, tobacco, that exposure gets to the entire lung. So if they develop one, one lung cancer, they're mo more prone to a second lung cancer. In breast cancer, it's not so clean cut, but when someone develops one breast cancer, they developed it for some reason, whether it's related to environment or genetics or something that happened, and they are more prone to a second breast cancer, and that risk is 1% per year that they live. So if they live for another 30 years, their risk is 30%. Um, other risk factors are precancerous lesions that would be seen on a biopsy. Um, the two most common types are atypical hyperplasia and LCIS. Um, atypical hyperplasia, whether it's ALH, which is lobular histology, or ADH, which is ductal histology, are both risk factors for breast cancer. In the Nurses Health study, there was a between 3.7 and 5.3 increased relative risk of breast cancer. And at 30 years, the incidence of breast cancer in people who had had a biopsy showing these lesions was 35%. Um, we'll talk about this in the preventative part, but there are medications such as tamoxifen that can decrease this risk by at least half, and some studies even suggest 70% with a precancerous lesion such as this. Um, the other big risk factor that's precancerous is something called LCIS, which stands for lobular carcinoma in situ. Um, this is, the, the name is misleading because it has carcinoma in it. This is not a cancer. It's a precancerous lesion. And it has a 7 to 18 um, increased relative risk of cancer, which translates to an absolute risk of 1% per year, which is similar to the risk of someone who had a prior breast cancer. 
Um, one thing about management of this, this is something that can be associated with a cancer nearby. So it does require a surgery to make sure that there's nothing else nearby if anyone ever has this. And there's another type of LCIS called pleomorphic LCIS that I won't go um, into too much detail, but the risk of a breast cancer with that type of lesion may even be higher than the 1%. So um, other risk factors, reproductive and menstrual history. So um, when you look at things, um, the longer a woman menstruates, the higher her risk. And it has a lot to do with hormone exposure. Um, the older a woman is when she has her first child, she's at a higher risk. The opposite of this is also true. If a woman has a child before age 20, they actually have a 50% decreased risk of breast cancer. So um, that's protective. Women who never have had children at a higher risk for breast cancer, women who start menses early before the age of 12 or have menopause late after the age of 55 are at a higher risk, and women who have hormone replacement therapy due to menopause, this is not the same as birth control, are at a slightly higher risk. Um, birth control is, you know, if you read the label, it says that it can increase breast cancer, but it can actually regulate hormones in the body where women actually have more regulated in lower levels. So even um, personally in my practice, even if I have someone who has a breast cancer gene, I allow them to go on oral contraceptives. Um, family health history is important as well. And if someone has inherited genes such as the breast cancer 1 or 2 gene, they're at a high risk. Um, I'm briefly going to go into this just so you know if you or someone else has a family history, the type of family histories that need to be evaluated. Um, the biggest thing is if you have more than two or three relatives on the same side of the family with breast cancer, you should probably at least get a pedigree done or talk to your doctor about this. So here is a list of the familial breast cancer syndromes. The most um, well-known is the BRCA1 and 2 genes, and um, these ha cause hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes. I'll go into those a little bit more because it's the most common. There's some rare syndromes like Gleifomini syndromes. And in this um, familial syndrome, they actually have a defect in the gene that's called P53, and they're prone to all cancers. And the families tend to have many, many different types of cancers and a lot of childhood cancers, specifically sarcomas and brain cancers. Um, we have two of these patients in all of Baylor right now to give you an idea of how rare this is. And it's probably limited to a couple hundred families worldwide. So it's not a common um, syndrome to have. There's some other rarer ones like Howden syndrome that's associated with the syndrome of thyroid cancer, breast cancer. Um, Poots Jaeger is has a lot more GI symptoms, but those women are at a higher risk. But um, these are things that if you have a lot of cancer in the family in general, you should get a risk evaluation. So um, the BRCA cancer, this is what a typical family um, would look like. In this diagram, it basically is a family history where circle are women and squares are men. And people that have an orange colored in circle or square have cancer. And people that have the yellow line are a carrier of the gene but do not actually have cancer. So not everyone who carries a gene is going to develop cancer. So in this family, um, this woman with breast cancer diagnosed at age 36 is a carrier of the BRCA gene, and this came through her father. And this is something we commonly see in, uh, in family where there is not as much cancer. And her father had a sister, her, her paternal aunt, who had ovarian cancer, and it came through grandma, and there was a great aunt with breast cancer and a cousin with breast cancer. So this is a typical family. And whenever we see breast cancer under the age of 50, they deserve a genetic evaluation where a pedigree is drawn out and a proper family history is taken. Um, what the breast cancer, um, when, when someone has a mutation in the breast cancer 1 gene, it affects the tumor suppressor gene, which has to do with DNA repair, making these women more prone to cancers. Um, when we look at the breast cancer 1 gene, women can be, have a, up to an 85% risk of one cancer. And of those 85% of people who develop one cancer, the risk of a second cancer can be as high as 60%. The risk of ovarian cancer can be as high as 45% in these women as well. Um, the breast cancer 2 gene is just located on a different chromosome. 
And this gene um, has similar risks for women in regard to breast and ovarian cancer, but has a higher rate of male breast cancer and other cancers such as pancreatic cancers. Um, so how, how does someone know what their risk of breast cancer is? That's a question I get all the time. Um, there's different models that have been validated and are commonly used. Um, the Gale model, I'm going to go into more detail. What, what the BRCA Pro is, is it's a genetic model that genetic counselors typically run. And this tells us what the risk of someone having a breast cancer gene is. Um, typically, if it's around 5 to 10 percent or higher, we will do the genetic test. Um, the Gale model, one of the biggest limitations with that model is it was designed for women that were 35 years of age or higher. And we often get young women who had a mother who passed away from cancer or something like that coming in wanting to know their risk. So these, there's a few other models that we don't use as commonly called the COST model and the EBIS model that would also be done by a genetic counselor that can tell us what an individual's risk is based on family history. So um, let me go into detail about the Gale model. So the Gale model is um, available on the internet. It's on the cancer.gov site. And what it does is it asks a list of questions about an individual. This model is designed for women without cancer who have not had a previous diagnosis of ductal carcinoma in site 2 or lobular carcinoma in site 2 because we already know their risk is high. It's going to be 1% per year. So it asks questions about how old the woman is when she started menses, how old she was when she had her first child, how many first degree relatives have breast cancer, and if they've ever had a breast biopsy showing atypical hyperplasia, we've already talked about that and how that increases the risk of breast cancer, and what the woman's race or ethnicity is, because as we discussed, Caucasians have a higher incidence of breast cancer than like blacks or Hispanics, for instance. So race itself will play a role in this model. Um, and this is an example. Um, I put in a woman who was 40 years old, started menses at age 12, had a first child at age 22, had one first degree relative with breast cancer, and has had one breast biopsy that shows atypical ductal hyperplasia, and she's Caucasian. So the way this model comes out is her five-year risk is 3.3%. The average woman, her age risk would be 0.6%. And this is a model that we use to decide if someone gets tamoxifen or not for prevention. And we'll talk more about tamoxifen, but the cutoff on this model is 1.7%. So if someone's risk is higher than that, they would get offered tamoxifen for prevention of breast cancer, and this woman would. The second thing this model gives you is a lifetime risk. And this lifetime risk is based on a life expectancy up to age 90. So for this woman, her, her risk, if she lived to 90, would be 38%, which is not low. And so this is a really good model for us telling people who come into our office what their individual risk of breast cancer is. Um, so let's talk about prevention. Um, I'm going to divide the prevention part of the talk into three different sections. So when we talk about carcinogenesis, which means the formation of cancer, there's different steps in cancer development. And that's why we call these primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So when you avoid the cause of cancer, that's called primary prevention. An example of this is not smoking, so you don't get lung cancer. Um, chemo prevention is when we do something, either medicine or surgical or that type of thing, to avoid getting cancer. And early detection is what we call screening, such as mammograms and MRIs, which doesn't prevent cancer, but it can catch it at earlier stages where you're more likely to cure the cancer. So um, we'll talk about primary prevention. And the main focus of this is going to be lifestyle changes. So um, diet and breast cancer. This is something that's commonly asked. So in all the studies that were done looking at fat intake, red meat, things like that, they're honestly all over the place and don't seem to be consistent. What we do know is that calorie reduction does decrease the risk of breast cancer. And there's a modest, if any, effect from fruits, vegetables, fish, fiber, or caffeine, or red meat. Um, in the Women's Health Initiative study, there was no risk reduction from decreased fat intake. And we also know from um, 
epidemiology studies that the Western diet is associated with increased risk of death from other causes, and there are higher rates of obesity in Western countries. So what we recommend is a low calorie diet to maintain ideal body weight, and we'll go into body weight, but that's actually an independent um, factor you can use to decrease your risk of breast cancer. A healthy diet, which we would recommend for anyone, with a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, poultry, fish, and all of this would reduce overall mortality as well, and it may reduce breast cancer risk, but the studies have been very difficult to do. So um, alcohol intake is the second thing I'm going to talk about. This is a consistent risk factor in multiple studies, and you can be at an increased risk of breast cancer with as little as three servings per day. Um, I'll talk about this in the secondary pre prevention part in more detail about the study, but in people who drink alcohol especially, the risk can be reduced by taking folic acid 800 micrograms per day. Um, with alcohol, it is a dose response. Um, the more alcohol you drink, the higher the relative risk. And one of the mechanisms thought to be related to this is that alcohol actually increases estrogen um, in the body. Um, one easy way to remember this is when you look at um, you know, men that are alcoholics, a lot of them have breasts, what we call galactorrhea, and it's because of this alcohol mechanism you see that. Um, it has also been shown with increased alcohol intake that there are increased risks of recurrence in people who have a prior history of breast cancer. And here's a curve just showing that the higher your alcohol intake, the higher the um, breast cancer risk is, whether it's for primary breast cancer or recurrence. So it's, it's, you know, it's not like, you know, after three drinks it goes sharply up. So it's a relative thing, and it's perfectly safe to have less than three drinks per week. Don't feel like you can't have a drink at all, but it's, you know, in moderation is what I would say. So um, the, the other big focus I want to talk about is exercise. Um, we'll go through a couple of the studies, but exercise, especially in recent studies, has clearly shown to significantly reduce the risk of breast cancer as well as other cancers. Um, Here's a couple studies. I'm going to focus on one, um, two of them. This is a study from the JAMA and um, Cancer Research in 2003 and 4. And what they focused on was walking, because walking is something almost everyone can do. And if you walk at a brisk pace, that's actually considered a moderate level of exercise. The recommendation for three to five hours a week comes from this study, and this decreased the risk of breast cancer by 0 0.7 to 0.8 relative risk. Um, also has to do with the mechanisms of estrogen and body fat, and exercise itself actually decreases estrogen in the body. Um, one way I like to remember this, if you think about super athletes, a lot of them lose their menstrual cycles because of decreased levels of hormones in their bodies. So when you think about it that way, it makes sense. Um, this is a study that was recently done in 2011, and this study um, looked at women from the Women's Health Initiative study. There was 4,643 women, and women who increased or maintained physical activity as recommended with um, three to five hours a week, at least three hours a week, including those who were inactive prior to diagnosis, had a 40 6% lower risk of all-cause mortality compared to women who remained inactive, and a 39% less risk of breast cancer-specific mortality. And if you think about this, this is huge. So women who exercise after a breast cancer diagnosis, even if they were inactive before, can still get the benefits. So this is a very important thing to take back to people. And, um, you know, we always talk about medicines and doing these other things. I think there needs to be a little bit more of a focus on lifestyle changes and adding good foods and exercise in your diet and decreasing alcohol intake. Um, this is a study from people that had had breast cancer as well, looking at, at recurrences. And in this study, I know it can be a little bit hard to read, but the black line is women that were very thin, a body mass index less than 23, Normal body mass index is below 25. You're considered overweight if it's between 25 and 30, and you're obese if it's above 30. And if you want to know what your body mass index is, you could just Google a body mass um, index calculator, and it'll come up, and you can put in your weight and height. 
And on this graph, the red is people that have a BMI greater than 35, and these are women that are considered morbidly obese. And what you see is that there is less, here at 10 years, there's much less breast cancer that comes back in women that are normal body weight. So um, staying thin, exercising, not gaining weight is very important. And this is probably related to um, estrogen as well, although this was also seen in women that had estrogen-negative breast cancers. So um, one thing that, you know, when we talk to young women or women whose mothers or family members had breast cancer to emphasize is breastfeeding. Um, this was a study that was, um, you know, I didn't put in the year. It was recently published in The Lancet. And they looked at 47 different studies in 30 countries. And what they found that was fewer women with cancer than women without cancer, um, I'm sorry, women, let me read this right. People that had, essentially people that had breastfed had less breast cancer. And what they saw was that for every 12 months you breastfed, there's a 4.3% relative risk decrease in your risk of breast cancer. And for every child you had, there was a 7% decrease. And this also has to do with changes in the breast, breast density, and good things in the breast. So if someone breastfeeds for more than a couple years total, so it's a cumulative effect. So if you have two children and breastfeed each child for a year, it's a cumulative effect. There's breast, less breast cancer. And what I thought was very interesting was that they looked at this um, in developed versus undeveloped countries, um, age, menopausal status, and the number of births. And this was an independent risk factor, whether someone um, breastfed or not. And they concluded that breastfeeding could account for almost two-thirds of the estimated risk reduction in cancer um, incidence. And the longer a woman breastfeeds, the more they are protected against breast cancer. And um, this is one of the reasons they hypothesize that there's less breast cancer in um, undeveloped countries, because they're a little bit more prone to breastfeed because they can't afford to not breastfeed. So um, this is something I think if you have had breast cancer, then your family you should emphasize with your children or relatives, because this is something that has benefits beyond this. It helps the child's immune system and everything else. And now um, there are actually campaigns in gynecology offices promoting this, that breastfeed, it'll also decrease your risk of breast cancer. Um, so what should you do? So what I recommend to people is to stay thin, a normal body mass index, to exercise three to five hours per week, and even if you're walking, that's very good exercise. What that amounts to is um, 30 minutes a day or one hour every other day, and you would get that amount of exercise in. Um, to drink less than three drinks per week, breastfeed if possible, and if you drink alcohol or don't eat a lot of greens in your um, diet to take folic acid, and I'll go through this study, but the dose would be 800 micrograms per day. So um, let's go into secondary prevention. So these are therapies to prevent breast cancer. Um, so the most effective way to prevent breast cancer, which I'm not recommending to every person out there at all, is prophylactic surgeries. So people that have a very high risk of breast cancer, for example, someone that has a breast cancer gene and has up to an 85% risk of a first breast cancer and a 60% risk of a second breast cancer, these are the women I'm talking about. They're more likely to get breast cancer than not. And in these studies, you could reduce the risk of breast cancer between 90 and 100%. Um, we can never get all of the breast tissue out when we do a surgery. And nowadays, for cosmetic and even um, sexual purposes, they're doing skin and nipple sparing mastectomies, where a woman can keep the sensation and look of the breast. And so um, this is something that we, I would only recommend for someone who is at, at an extraordinarily high risk of breast cancer. Um, so what, what's more applicable to the general population is what we call chemo prevention, so medicines to prevent breast cancer. And there's two FDA-approved medicines for this and one um, off-label use. And these medicines are tamoxifen and raloxifen, which are in the class of drugs I'm about to talk about called SERMs. And there's um, a 
prelim trial out with the use of XMS stain that I'll also talk about. So um, preventative therapy. So what are SERMs? Um, SERMs is a class of medications that stands for Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators. The two that are FDA approved in the prevention of breast cancer are tamoxifen and romoxifen. And the way these medicines work is they act differently on estrogen receptors in the body. So in the breast, they block estrogen. And for example, in the bones, they increase estrogen. So they actually make the bones stronger. The other name for raloxifen is Avista, and it's commonly used in the treatment of osteoporosis. And so it, it explains the side effects of these medications as well. So they can decrease the risk of breast cancer by 30% or more, and we'll go into the studies. And um, they increase bone mineral density and decrease the risk of bone fractures. So um, I'm going to talk about two clinical trials, and these were um, national trials. And um, this first one is called the P1, or Prevention Study 1 trial. And what this study did is it took people that were age 35 to 70 and considered high risk, which was defined as um, a five-year risk on the Yale model of 1.7% or higher. And there was over 13,000 women in this study, and they were randomly assigned to take tamoxifen for five years or a sugar pill for five years, and they didn't know which one they were taking. They actually stopped this study early because they found at the midpoint or interim analysis that there was a 49% reduction in breast cancer. So this is where that number, if you hear doctors talk of a 50% decrease in breast cancer from these medicines come from. And it may actually have even been higher, but they stopped the study early because they didn't want these women on the sugar pills to not be able to take the medicine because that would be an unethical thing to do. So we'll never know the exact number, but there are some studies done with atypical hyperplasia that show that the, it might actually be even up to 70% decrease. So I always tell people it would be at least a 50% decrease. Um, this is the second prevention trial, the P2 trial, that um, same criteria looked at women that were at a high risk of breast cancer, and they had 19,000 women in this study. And they compared tamoxifen to raloxifen. And the reason they compared this is tamoxifen has a lot of um, side effects. Um, honestly, most women tolerate it well. About 20% will have hot flashes or vaginal dryness. But we, what we worry about is there's a pro-estrogen effect on the blood vessels, and there's a 1% risk of, of a blood clot. And there's also a pro-estrogen effect on the uterus. So there's a 1% risk of uterine cancer. <laughs> So raloxifen has similar properties, but had half the side effects associated with it. So that's why this study was done. And what they saw was they had similar efficacy. The breast cancer incidence was similar in the two groups, but there was more non-invasive cancers in the raloxifen group, what we call DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ, and there was more precancerous lesions like atypical hyperplasia. So. Um, the raloxifen does have fewer side effects. So this is, um, physicians often use either of these medications. The blood clot and uterine cancer risk is um, mostly in women over the age of 50. So any woman under the age of 50, I usually will place on tamoxifen. And women older than 50, it's a conversation you would have with the physician about whether which medicine to use. But um, I will tell you, almost every oncologist out there does believe tamoxifen is a better medication because of these um, of the non-invasive cancer increased incidence in the raloxifen arm. So um, there's other studies out there that I'm not going to go into, but all these studies kind of show that these serums reduce the breast cancer incidence by 32 to 74 percent, which is not 100 percent. So if someone goes on these medicines for prevention, it's still not a guarantee you're not going to get breast cancer, but it does reduce the risk by a lot. Um, the one thing from these trials that we're lacking and is in desperate need of research is that there's not good prevention medicines or things like that for estrogen-negative breast cancers. These medicines only work if the precancerous, you know, like we also use this um, tamoxifen to prevent a second cancer in someone that has a stage zero cancer, a ductal carcinoma in situ. And in those studies, they found that if the ductal carcinoma in situ was estrogen negative, the tamoxifen did not decrease the risk of a future cancer.
like it would in an estrogen positive woman. So this is an area that we're still lacking um, preventative medicines that there's a lot of research being done in. So um, this is a more recent study, and this was published in June of last year in the New England Journal of Medicine and presented at ASCO um, the prior year. And what, what this show, this study is looking at 4,560 women. And it's looking at the medicine exemestane versus placebo. So exemestane is a medicine that we commonly use in the treatment of breast cancer um, in someone that has estrogen positive cancer. The brand name is known as aromacin. And um, this completely blocks estrogen in the body. So at a medium follow-up of 35 months, um, there were 11 cancers that developed in the exemestane group and 32 cancers that developed in the placebo group. So there's a 65% relative reduction. Um, caution with this data. This is not mature data. This was an interim um, data. It does not have the power or the number of cancers to really say that it's this effective, but it does suggest that it's going to be at least as good as tamoxifen or raloxifen. And I will tell you, a lot of oncologists will use this off-label in women that cannot get tamoxifen or raloxifen. For example, if someone has had a blood clot, they can't go on those medicines. So that's one area we sometimes do use this medicine off-label. So um, this data, um, they're going to have to do another final analysis, and we'll have the final answer to this. Um, the, the thing about exemestane is it doesn't have that blood clot or uterine cancer side effect associated with it. So it's something that people are looking forward to seeing if it, what the final data shows. With that said, um, this class of drugs, aromatase inhibitors, has some other side effects like arthritis and decreased bone mineral density that tamoxifen doesn't have. So it would, it would give us another option for the prevention of estrogen positive breast cancers. Um, here, um, I'm going to put folic acid in here. It could also go in the alternative medicine um, data. But um, this is a study that was published back in 2003 and is also from the Nurses' Health Study data. And the Nurses' Health Study took about 33,000 women who had blood samples and followed them for the development of breast cancer. So concerning the folic acid and vitamin B part, there were 712 breast cancer patients that were matched to controls. And what they found was that higher levels of folic acid were associated with lower breast cancer risk especially in women with modest alcohol consumption, which is 15 grams per day, which is about three drinks per day. That's where that number comes from. And in postmenopausal women. And premenopausal women with the highest plasma B12 levels also have lower breast cancer risk. So what these authors concluded was that um, folic acid and B12, a lot of these come in a B complex vitamin, will have a combination of the two. Um, may contribute to a reduction in risk of breast cancer. So in my practice, where I use this is in women who do drink alcohol, and a lot of people like their glass of wine every night and aren't going to change their habits. So most of those women will take folic acid. It definitely can't do any harm. Um, it's the same prenatal vitamin people take to prevent birth defects. So it's, most people have been on it at some point in their life if they're a woman and had a child. Okay, so tertiary prevention. I'm, gonna, I'm only going to briefly touch on this so we have um, plenty of time for questions. Um, this is early detection. Almost everyone knows the guidelines that are out there that are active in the breast cancer world and probably listening to this talk. But the um, current um, guidelines recommend a mammogram. Every, I'm going to qualify this. I know people are going to say something about this, but for age 40 to 50, the recommendation is every one to two years, and age 50 and older, it's annually. For self-breast exam, it's age 20 and older monthly. I will tell you there's a lot of controversy over breast self-exam and whether people should do them or not. Um, I personally believe they work if you do them regularly and you know your breasts, but a lot of people have lumpy breasts and they're not comfortable for them and I don't think those people should do them because it ends up causing all these scares and different things. So there is definitely some women that would benefit from this, especially if you have a strong family history or carry a gene. And then a clinical breast exam from age 20 to 40, it's every three years you can get these with your pelvic exams and from age 40 and older it's recommended um, annually. So um, recently, these recommendations, like I've said, have been questioned. 
And um, most experts do not agree with the new recommendations, including Baylor and the ACS. So what we recommend at Baylor is annual mammography starting at age 40. But you will find controversy, and we're not going to go into that into a lot of detail today. Um, mammograms definitely do save lives. This has also you know, been looked at. And in a meta-analysis of 13 prospective randomized trials, there was a 26% reduction in the relatively, um, relative risk of breast cancer mortality or dying from breast cancer from screening mammograms for women aged 50 to 74. So that's why that 40 to 50 group, no one really knows the true benefit of yearly mammograms in those women. So that's why you see that in some guidelines now. Um, advances in breast cancer screening. Um, there's a lot of new imaging coming up. There's actually at the summit going to be a conference um, about this, so I'll let them talk about it then. But um, breast MRI is something that we are doing now, and it is covered by ins certain insurances. Um, we use this in high-risk groups. So any insurance will cover it if someone has a hereditary breast cancer syndrome, whether it's the BRCA1 or 2 or one of the other ones in the list I showed earlier. Um, there are guidelines out there that do recommend breast MRI in women with a greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer. And this risk could be calculated on the Gale model or the Klaus model or the EVIS model that I mentioned earlier. And women who have DCIS and LCIS have a 1% risk per year. So a lot of these women would fall in this category as well. I will tell you, um, not everyone is utilizing this. Um, breast MRIs are good, but sometimes they can pick up small benign lesions and lead to overbiopsy. And the technique is very important that you have a radiologist who is very good and comfortable looking at breast MRIs. And um, if you're not sure how to know that about a center, um, one thing to look at is their biopsy rate, and it should not be terribly high um, for cancers found. I'll tell you, um, I offer first tamoxifen to women that are high risk, and if their residual lifetime risk after the 50% reduction is still greater than 25%, I will add MRIs on. Some women don't want to take medicine, and then I'll offer them MRIs. The only insurance company that I've had who does not choose to follow these guidelines consistently is Blue Cross. So this is something that they typically don't cover. Um, and some of the smaller private insurances, that, especially with large deductibles, a lot of them won't cover this. But a lot of the other major insurance providers, just like Aetna United, will cover this. So it's something you'd have to talk to your doctor and insurance company about. And um, the last section is going to be on alternative medicines. Um, I'm going to talk about the herbal medications I commonly get asked about. And I'm going to preface this by saying that a lot of these have some estrogen in them. So you shouldn't use them, especially if you have a prior history of breast cancer. And you shouldn't use them without talking to your physician. And um, the website I have listed here, you can easily find it if you Google herbal medications in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. This is the best website I have personally found talking about herbal medications. And the reason I like it is you can just type in the name of a medicine. They'll ask you to sign some kind of waiver and accept it. But then what it will do is it will tell you what's in that herbal medication. And the clinical trial, that is data that's known about the medicine, and it will put warnings on there, like if you have breast cancer, don't use this. And it's, it's a nice summary of all the available literature. And I will tell you, a lot of there's, there's not a lot of literature on a lot of herbal medications. But it's the best that I've found, because a lot of people will ask me about these things. So I'm going to talk about these four today, because they're the most common ones I get asked about. So um, black cohosh, um, you know, there's question about whether this is actually anti-estrogen or it works in an estrogen pathway, such as HER2. People don't really know. So um, in this particular study, this was done in two, published in 2007, they looked at about 1,000 patients with breast cancer. And what they found was that the use of black cohosh was associated with the reduction in breast cancer risk. Um, this is a small group. It's not prospective, meaning people weren't randomly assigned to get this medicine versus not, but this is where some of that comes from. 
Um, however, this is also sometimes used to um, treat hot flashes herbally. And there may be some estrogen receptor activity in this medicine. So it's something we do not recommend at all for people that have breast cancer at this time. Um, sometimes people have postmenopausal hot flashes, that type of thing. That's the setting this is typically used in. And the problem with herbal medications is pharmaceutical companies aren't going to make a lot of money on these. So they're not going to support large clinical trials. So we may never know the answers to some of these questions out there. The second one I get asked a lot about is soy. And um, I know Northwestern is doing a big study on soy. There's some other institutes. So we may actually get some answers about soy. But um, soy seems to perhaps exhibit some anti-tumor effects in breast cancer and other breast cancer, um, I'm sorry, other cancers. However, there's also been studies that show that it might interfere with tamoxifen. So if you're on some of these breast cancer treatments or medicines, I would probably avoid them because we know that tamoxifen works and is very effective in reducing breast cancer. We don't know the effects soy has on tamoxifen or other things. So um, if you're talking about preventing breast cancer, when they look at Asian cultures that have a lot of soy, some of the studies from there do suggest there might be a decrease. So if someone uses this, I would talk to their physician about it, but it would be more in a preventative setting, not in someone with known breast cancer. Um, the the um, flaxseed has some similar properties to soy, and um, it actually has es um, estrogenic effects. So this is something that someone with breast cancer should also avoid. However, they've done some mice studies with this, and they actually show that it inhibits the growth and spread of breast cancer. So this is something that is being looked into, but it's not ready for use in any type of breast cancer patient at this time. Um, what I tell people, I, I get asked about this a lot, like should I completely avoid flaxseed? If it's something that's in a dish or you're not taking high doses of, it's probably fine and safe, and that's true of most things. But if, you're if you have breast cancer and you're taking you know, a couple spoonfuls every day, that's probably something you shouldn't do. But if it's something a little bit here or there in food, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, evening primrose is something I also get um, asked about. Honestly, this um, has more to do with breast pain. There was one study that showed that it could decrease breast pain, but when they did a bigger analysis of several studies, this was not found to be true. I will tell you antidotally, I have had a few patients who have had relief from this. Um, there's other studies with breast pain about reducing caffeine intake and some things, but those are more related to breast pain. Um, there is one study looking at therapy of breast cancer that shows that it might make treatment more effective, but a lot more studies are needed into this, and it's really not a preventative indication. And um, I think I think that's all. So I'm going to open up for questions now. You can um, also type in questions, and if you don't want to ask over the phone or type them in, you're welcome to email me. You're just so thorough, Julie. <laughs> That's all right. I don't have any questions. All right, well, if there are no questions, if you think of any, just um, I see Doris typing. But um, I'll go ahead and I'll thank Julie, and just I also want to thank the rest of the program committee. Um, uh, who helps put these uh, webinars together. So uh, Laura Pena and Lizette Martinez um, from Harris County Hospital District and uh, Gina Lawson with BCCS in Austin. Um, so thank you to them. And then uh, Doris is requesting a copy of the presentation. And actually, if you look at the top left-hand corner of your screen where it says Files 2, um, if you click on the, the name of that file, you can actually download it. And I'll also email it to everybody who's registered. Um, and a copy of this presentation will also be posted to um, our YouTube, and I'll, I'll send everybody an email about that, too. So uh, thank you again, Julie, and thanks to everybody who listened in. Um, I just want to let you know about uh, next month's um, webinar. It's again on the fourth Thursday, um, September 27th at noon. It's going to be on um, health disparities and challenges in accessing quality care uh, for LGBT people. So it, it will be presented by Shane Snowden, uh, who works for the Human Rights Campaign in San Francisco. So that will be a really good one. So, um, oh, and also coming up, 
just so you know, our Breast Health Summit is coming up October 25th, 26th in okay. Houston. Oh, somebody has a question. Go ahead. Okay, well, never mind. All right, thanks, everybody.